Okay, great. All right. Um, the Lord be with you guys. <laughs> also with you. Also with you. All right, let's pray. Lord, thank you for the um, ability to be together uh, via this technology, for the grace that you give each one of us in manifold ways uh, by preaching and by um, the love of other people. And we pray for uh, this day and this class. I pray for everybody here and their families. And I ask your Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us uh, as we're together this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 <clears throat> um, okay, so I'll just say something real quick and then, um, um, and then I'll pass it back to you, Paul. But um, I'm so glad to see everyone, albeit virtually, um, my name's Ethan Richardson. I've been on staff at Christ Church for quite some time uh, in a variety of different uh, formats. Uh, but my newest format is as a therapist in residence, and I'm really excited to, uh, to take on this role and to, to be there to provide counseling services for um, the parish and also the surrounding community. Um, I'm also working part-time at a clinic uh, in town called the Attachment Clinic, uh, and we do family therapy there. Um, and as we were talking about kind of doing some sort of adult ed series this year, um, one of the things that came to mind for us was that uh, despite the fact that we're, we're in 2021, um, the sense of burnout from 2020 is still with us. And um, despite the fact that January is often the year that we feel uh, so much like there's a chance for a new beginning, uh, so much feels the same, uh, especially in our day-to-day -day lives. Um, maybe that's just me speaking personally, but I don't think so. Um, some of the parishioners that I've talked to just in the last couple of weeks have said the same thing. And um, so, yeah, over the next five weeks, we're going to be talking about mental health and um, sort of the converging uh, frameworks of, of psychology and uh, the theology that we talk about here at Christ Church. So um, I'll stop there and then um, let Paul say what, what he wants to say, and then, and then we'll get, get started. Great. Thanks, Ethan. Uh, lovely to see everybody's faces uh, this morning, and um, I guess what I would say just as a brief overview is what we have on the welcome page uh, for our Christchurch website about preaching the gospel. I mean, our mission is preach the gospel, love people, and trust God, and the, the preaching of the gospel and the loving people intersect with um, what we feel is God's work in pastoral counseling. Uh, we also have on our website that verse from 1 Peter that says, cast all your cares on him who cares for you, uh, which is, you know, casting our cares on Jesus because he loves you. Uh, but it's also helpful to have another human being right in front of you to cast your cares upon, upon whom to cast your cares. And that person, uh, I, we have found, uh, Christy and I, just in our lives with our marriage and, uh, and personally, that, that having a trusted counselor is one of the key components of the whole circle of grace, uh, which God um, surrounds us with, is you, you hear the gospel on a Sunday morning or, you know, at some other time or through music, et cetera, in different ways, it's, and it, and it, relates uh, deeply to your heart and you feel um, a sense of relief and a sense of God's love for you. But then, you know, it just vanishes often. And what we said, I know Josh said in the sermon this morning, life is difficult and it is super, I don't know, not just helpful, but in my opinion, um, everybody needs it. Uh, everybody needs somebody to, to go to that you can unburden yourself on the deepest level uh, to that person, and you can be loved as you are. Um, I know Ethan would tell you that sort of, you know, high percentage of the effectiveness of a 
of pastoral counseling or counseling in general, just as this is the relationship of trust so that you can actually say all of the terrible stuff that is down inside of you to another person and that person doesn't run away. Um, that person hears it, uh, that person um, then responds in love to you. And that's a key component uh, to the whole transactional, it's not transactional, but the relationship between a, a somebody in counseling and a counselor. And then, you know, Ethan has been trained and trained counselors are uh, clued in to not only just have that kind of listening ability, but then to put some pieces together um, to help, help, help us. So I would say that the, the gospel sets you free uh, in the preaching of it. And then, yet there's another component in the one-on-one, -on -one, which is crucial. Um, there's also uh, groups, grief groups can be extremely um, helpful too. And I can let uh, Ethan and Mary Lou talk more about that. But what I would say within the context of grace is that God loves us as we say all the time, not as we should be, but as we, as we actually are. And a counseling relationship allows you to go deeper than you can, even, even with friends or, or family, because oftentimes family is the problem. Um, so that you go to a person who, who can be there for you. Uh, and that is, uh, uh, in my experience and in my theology, a key piece of God's, um, God's a circle of healing uh, that that each person needs. So I'll stop there, Ethan. Um, yeah. Unless you want me to add anything else. No, that's great. <clears throat> Thanks, Paul. Okay. Um, yeah, I'll I'll just add that um, several people have reached out um, in in just the last couple of weeks and ha have said that exact thing. Like, I have a loving family; they care a lot about me, but. Um, they also worry about me. And so I need to talk to someone who isn't going, who I'm not going to just overload with worry. Um, and yeah, it's, it's true for all families. There's, uh, there's a certain relief that um, I can unburden myself to a professional uh, in, in a confidential relationship um, that is rooted in grace that is rooted in um, being loved as you are, not as you should be. So, all right, I'm going to try to share screen here. I've got a little presentation. Um, let's see. Can you all see that? Thumbs up if you can. Okay. Um, let's see. So one of the things that uh, I, I was thinking as I was putting this together was um, a lot of times when January comes, and I'm, I'm just as guilty of this. Excuse me, uh, I have lost the sound. Am I the only one who can't hear? Can everybody else hear me okay? I can hear. I can hear. Okay. Okay. I'll figure Maybe it out. Maybe try to sign out and sign back in. Yeah, I'll see what's going on. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, there there is this sense at the beginning of every year that um, it's it's time to make some changes, and uh, maybe maybe the turning of a calendar has has like um, spawned that inspiration in you, or maybe it's just. Um, you know, you had a bad week at work. Uh, so it doesn't always happen in January, but we're always looking for change. And one of the themes that we're um, covering in these five uh, adult ed uh, workshops is the question of what brings about change? What really makes people change? And psychology has some thoughts and answers um, that I think Mary Lou and Paul and I would say are, are good, but they're insufficient. And then there's the ultimate hope for change, which lies in God. And you could just leave it at that and say that, you know, psychology can't give the answers that um, 
that we need. The answers are in Jesus, but psychology does provide um, some really clear pictures and descriptions of um, of human suffering, you know, the ways that we suffer and the things that we do to both to ourselves and to each other. Um, and they can also point at the types of things that can make us heal, that can make us feel better. So um, one of the things that's been cool to see as I've learned more um, is that a lot of these insights uh, really run parallel to some of the things that we talk about at church, some of the things that we believe both about human nature and about relationships, what, what brings about um, healing in relationships. So, um, but I want to start here because this is kind of how at least I'm feeling right now, and maybe you are too. I don't know if you've seen this, but um, it's from it's from Saturday Night, Saturday Night Live. Here we go. Memories, not miracles. I wish I could see if you all are laughing or not, um, but I'm just going to have to go with my quiet room. Um, yeah, the promo code says same sad you in the bottom. <laughs> um, so anyway, maybe you're feeling like 2021 is going to be your, your trip to Italy. Um, but the truth is, and we talk about this at church all the time, and psychology tells us this over and over again, uh, we are the same sad us, and we take us with us wherever we go. And so uh, regardless of what you think, what, what external fix might create the new you, uh, sadly, it's not going to do it because you're still you. So um, let's talk a little bit about psychology. Um, psychology started with this man. Um, who, as Paul was saying, you know, counseling can be really good when you're, when you're in a relationship with someone that you feel like you can trust. I don't know that I would trust this man. He looks a little intimidating. Um, but people, and especially people who go to church for very good reasons, have some skepticism or wariness about psychology and about uh, sort of things being framed in a psychological way. And it's for good reasons. You know, psychology um, in a lot of ways can feel sort of antithetical to faith. Um, it can sound like you're describing all human problems as being sort of in the brain or um, in the way that your mother treated you. And, uh, and that the fixes can be found there too. So if I, if I have like something wrong with my brain, I can just take medicine or I can sit with this scary gentleman and suddenly um, I'm, all, I'm gonna be better because my brain is fixed. Um, and therapists are in TV now all the time, but they don't really look any different They're all the same. They're all balding middle-aged men and I'm like joining the crew, you know? Um, but anyways, psychology, that word psyche is actually spirit or soul. And, um, and so psychology is the study of the spirit, the human spirit, the human soul. And while it's, um, it's often pigeonholed as the science of the brain. Uh, it's, it's meant to be a, a science of um, the human soul, what makes us us. And that can't be limited to chemicals in the brain or um, you know, maternal attachment patterns. It's, it's much more holistic than just mental illness and mental healing. Um, so I understand the hesitation about psychology um, because if you frame everything in terms of uh, mental illness, there's no talk necessarily of good and evil, um, of sin, 
and also of our need for a savior. Um, but the study of the soul, um, while it may not point us uh, necessarily to Jesus Christ, um, it does do a surprisingly good job at describing human nature um, in a way that needs something outside of itself um, for healing. And the descriptions that we find in psychology of human nature very often coincide with the way that the Bible describes uh, who we are and what we need. Uh, so at Christ Church, a lot of times um, we talk about low anthropology and, you know, that Romano Tours video is the perfect example of um, the sense that we can't necessarily bring about the change that we want to see in our lives. You know, Gandhi said, be the change you want to see in the world. We can't do that. We can't even do that in ourselves. And while there are plenty of blogs and advice columns and, uh, you know, life coaches out there saying, you know, try this 12, uh, 12 item program every month and you'll be, you know, a healthier you. Uh, we usually stop after the second one, or we do all 12 and we still don't feel any differently. So low anthropology is basically the sense that we can't do it on our own. Uh, we, we're self-defeating, despite the fact that we want to be a certain type of person um, and that God calls us to be a certain type of person, we fail. Uh, we get in our own way. And psychology, especially starting with Freud, had the same thing to say. You know, um, I'll get into what Freud said, but this is what the Bible says. The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? Don't you see that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and then out of the body, but the things that come out of a person's mouth come from the heart, and these defile them. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. These are what defile a person. So then the thought becomes, well, yeah, I know I have these bad thoughts, but... God helps me stop them, you know, God, with the power of, of God's spirit um, and, and going to church and filling my life with the good things, um, maybe I have the power in me to stop doing those things. Maybe I can stop having the thoughts that are self-defeating. Um, and I don't know if you all have seen this, but here, let me see. This is an, old, an oldie but a goodie. Uh, Dr. Switzer? Uh, yes, C come in. I'm just, just washing my hands. Uh, I'm Catherine Bigman. Janet Carlisle referred me. Oh, yes. Uh, still being uh, very alive in a box. <laughs> yes. Yes, that's me. <laughs> Should I lay down? Oh, no, no, no. We don't, we don't do that anymore. Just, just have a tea. And, uh, and let, let me uh, tell you a, a bit about our, our billing. I... Um, I charge five dollars for the for the first five minutes, and and then absolutely nothing after that. How, how, how does that sound? That sounds great. <laughs> Too good to be true, as a matter of fact. <laughs> well, I can I can almost guarantee you that that our session won't last the full uh, the full five minutes. Now, um, <laughs> we don't do any insurance billing, so you would either have to pay in in cash or by check. <clears throat> wow. Okay. And I, and I I don't make change. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and <Okay>. go. <laughs> go. Well, tell what? me, tell me about the problem uh, that you wish to address. Oh, okay. Uh, well, I have this fear of being buried alive in a box. <laughs> I just, I start thinking about being buried alive and I begin to panic. 
Has, has, has anyone ever, ever tried to, to bury you alive in a box? No. No, but truly thinking about it does make my life horrible. I mean, I can't go through tunnels or be in an elevator or in a house. Anything boxy. So what, what you're saying is you're, uh, you're claustrophobic. Uh, yes. Yes, that's it. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, let's go, Catherine. I'm, uh, I'm going to uh, say two words to you right now. I, I want you to listen to them very, very carefully. Then I want you to take them out of the office with you and incorporate them in, into your life. Well, shall I uh, write them down? Well, it, if it makes you comfortable, it's just two words. Most we find most people can uh, can remember them. <laughs> okay. You ready? Yes. Okay. Here, here they are. Stop it! <laughs> I'm sorry. Stop it! Stop it! Yes. S T O P. New word. I T. <laughs> so, what are you saying? <laughs> you, you know, it's funny. I, I, I say two simple words, and I cannot tell you the amount of people who say exactly the same thing you're saying. I mean, this, you know, this is not Yiddish, Catherine. This is English. Stop it. So I should just stop it. There you go. I mean, you, you, you don't want to go through life being scared of being buried alive in a box, do you? I mean, that sounds, sounds frightening. <laughs> yes. Then stop it! I, I can't. I mean, it's been with me no, since no, no, childhood. No, no, no. We, we, we don't go there. Just, just stop. It. So I should just stop being afraid of being buried alive in a box. You got it. Good girl. Well, it's only been, it's only been three minutes, so that will be um, uh, three dollars. Uh, I only have a five, so. Well, I, I don't, I don't make change. <laughs> okay, I'm going to stop there. Just so you know, that's my therapy paradigm. So if um, if any of you all are thinking about counseling, um, it's really quick. You'll be a new you before you know it. Um, okay, so I I play that <laughs> um, because it's funny, but also because. Uh, Freud and St. Paul were on the same page when it comes to um, the power of stop it. Um, there's no amount of sort of behavioral, behavioral modifications or self-talk uh, that can necessarily change a person from the inside out. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, Dr. Switzer? This is what Paul said. I have the desire to do what is good, but I can't carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do. This I keep on doing. And uh, Freud saw this in his patients. He called it the repetition compulsion, the, the compulsion to repeat, going back to the same suffering over and over again, despite the fact that you know it causes suffering, despite the fact that even your parents suffered in the same way. Um, that it's alienating you, that it's causing, you know, marital strife, that it's causing um, you to feel the way you feel over and over again, you can't stop. You can't just say, stop it. It's not enough. Um, so both Freud and um, one of his, uh, one of his colleagues, rivals, uh, Carl Jung, uh, we're, we're both aware of these inner drives, these, these, inner, these inner motivations that are sometimes not even conscious to us in the same way that St. Paul said, I don't understand what I do. I, I want to do the right thing, but I don't understand that I can't do it. I can't somehow pull it together enough. And um, Carl Jung said, that um, very similar to Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, every one of us um, has this hidden part of us, a hidden, a hidden self, a shadow self. And despite the fact that we, um, that we may want the good, 
there is something inside of us that is pushing the good away. Um, and the more we push the Mr. Hyde further and further away from ourselves, uh, the more suffering we have. So um, in this way, I think like psychology um, can be a real aid in, in understanding and describing human nature and the ways that we suffer, uh, the ways that we get stuck. Um, and according to both, according to St. Paul, according to Freud, according to, um, you know, the long Christian tradition and the long psychological tradition, everyone suffers. Suffering is sort of a, you know, an equal opportunity employer. You know, you don't have to have a certain resume to suffer. Everyone suffers. And you may suffer in a particular way, um, but you're human and therefore you suffer. Um, and it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what you, what you believe or what skills you develop um, or what background you come from. It's, it's, it's still, it's just part of the job description. <laughs> it comes with who we are. And everyone, at least some time in their life, needs help, needs help to sort of get around it. Um, one of the things that Freud's um, rival, Carl Jung, said uh, about this Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, this shadow self that kind of lives within us, um, was pretty interesting. He said, one does not become enlightened by imagining figures of light, but by making the darkness conscious. The latter procedure, however, is disagreeable and therefore not popular. And what he's talking about is uh, we don't like to think about the parts of ourselves that embarrass us or that bring about shame or that um, make us feel like failures. Those are the parts that if we could just get rid of them, if we could just put them away, we would be happier. But those parts of the self, those uh, neglected parts of the self, um, the more they get put away, the louder they become. That was, that was Jung's idea. Uh, the more that we, we ignore the sin, the more we ignore the problem that besets us, uh, the more that problem becomes a hindrance to the way we live our life. And um, so he saw therapy, and I agree with him here, um, as a way of, a gentle way of sort of accessing those parts of ourselves that we would otherwise ignore. And for the rest of the world, we don't show them um, that those parts of ourselves. And the more I've, I've read about Jung, and the more I've thought about this particular idea, the more I've also thought about um, what we preach at Christ Church, um, the theology of the cross, the, the idea that God isn't, didn't come um, in a figure of light, but, um, but in the darkness of night, and, and that salvation came in the darkness, and that God's way of working happens in the darkness. And while we are striving after glory, striving after winning, striving after good impressions, uh, God comes in what is disagreeable. God comes in what is, um, yeah, not, not, the, not the prettiest. And so um, that's kind of where I want to end today, um, the notion that, like, um, change, and, and we're going to talk about sort of the nature of change over the next four um, weekly meetings, but change happens not in the, um, the boosting of positives, but in the accessing of negatives in the, um, in the cross. So with that in mind, um, and this is, the, this is Luther's seal, um, the human heart, that is, um, that is marked by the black cross of death and that hope only comes uh, with, with a heart that has been branded um, by the sin and the redemption that came in the cross. 
um, I want to read, I want to read this devotion. Um, I don't know if you guys can see me because this is up, but uh, Mockingbird just came out with a new devotional. And um, there's one that's really appropriate for what we're talking about today. And um, it's from someone named Chad Bird. And uh, this is the scripture that's up on the screen. This is the scripture that he's uh, writing about. So if I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. In the culture of perfectionism, in which meticulously curated images are how individuals cultivate their personal brand, Paul's statement is the equivalent of posting a close-up of the monster zit growing on the end of his nose. Zits may happen, but goodness gracious, we don't photograph them for all the world to see. Blemishes and scars, weaknesses and shames all fall into the cover them up category. Not so with the Apostle Paul. He's going to brag about them. A back mangled by Jewish lashes and Roman rods. Yes, sir. Scars from being stoned. Oh, yeah. Shipwrecked. Been there. Done that. Imprisoned. More than once. Sleepless nights. Starving. Thirsty. Cold. Without shelter. All on my resume. And to top it all off, a thorn in the flesh. A messenger of Satan. That despite the repeated attempts to get God to take it away, is still there, tormenting him. Yep, that too. Paul is a walking, talking nightmare of a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad ministry, or so it would seem. Quite shockingly, he says that in all his weaknesses and wounds and persecutions, he is content. Not only that, but he'll boast about them. Why? Quote, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Paul came to the hard and inescapable conclusion that slowly and painfully every follower of Jesus learns. The more there is of, of us in us, the less there is of Christ in us. So God pulls the drain out of the bottom of our lives to empty us out. Our pride, our vanity, our perfectionism, our the world revolves around me egoism our grandstanding our virtue signaling god has his ways of emptying us as he emptied paul so that he might suffuse that void with the power of christ and the fullness of the spirit when we are weak then we are strong for in the father's backwards way of dealing with us our weaknesses are but his door through which to walk into our lives with love with power with mercy and with peace. So that was from Chad Bird. Um, and I think that's a great place to stop. Um, yeah, psychology says that integration with um, the darkness is what brings about real healing. And um, we believe that that real healing um, came in the true darkness of the cross. Um, let me say a quick prayer, and then um, I would love to hear if you all have any, any questions or anything you want to share. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for bringing love to the darkest parts of our hearts. Thank you for uh, your ministry your death and resurrection, your power in our weakness. We pray that we would know that power in the parts of ourselves um, that we can't even bear to access. Lord, have mercy. Amen. Okay, I'll stop there. Thank you all for, for listening. Um, I'm going to stop the screen share. If anyone wants to speak up, please do. Oh, yes. Um, thoughts come into my mind about things I did years ago, and I've confessed my sins, and I read in the Bible commentary that 
God can give us the ability. Well, he, he forgives and forgets and he can give us the ability to forget. So that's what I'm working on. Mm. Mm, thanks for sharing that, Libby. Years ago, I, I read a, a small book that used the image you're talking about and acknowledging the darkness. And he used the language of embracing the fireball. Hmm. That we have to embrace that dark place and and know it and own it, become familiar with it before we can release it. Hmm. Wow! And, and I found that wonderfully good imagery for myself. Time yeah. And time again. Yeah, I like the fireball because the, there's a lot of energy that's caught up in in the in the darkness there, whichever metaphor you use. But there's a lot of energy in the thing that we're trying to uh, keep hidden. Um, a recovery, a recovery term is hugging the cactus. I don't know if you've heard that, but, um, yeah, hugging the cactus, hugging the, hugging the, um, the thorny part of yourself that, um, that you think, you know, no one, not even God would, would accept this part. Going back to Libby, uh, Sometimes you can forgive, but you, you, it's still there. The memory is still there, but you just keep, isn't it kind of an ongoing thing of giving it when it pops up, you give it, I'm done with it, God, you take it. Mm -hmm. And you're on a walk and you meet somebody and it brings back, or you hear from somebody about their mother or father and you go, no, I've dealt with that. Mm -hmm. God, it's in your hands now. It's hard mm -hmm. to forget because it's kind of who what make you what made you who you are hmm. does that make sense it does make sense does that make sense to you libby yes and also that god says there's we with no condemnation you know through the blood of christ we are forgiven hmm. and he yeah. <clears throat> thanks that helps yeah hey ethan this is jen i have a question yeah do you have any recommended like reading or books or something we could watch to go along with this course because the course is called inside out i don't know if that's an allusion to the pixar movie but the pixar movie yeah, yeah. suggested readings or books or other funny snl clips we could watch yeah yeah i can um maybe we can post something on on the on the website yeah, like a little supplement because i feel like yeah Right. I'll, um, yeah, I'll make a little like supplemental reading and viewing list that cool. people can peruse cool. at their leisure. Does that sound good? Yes. yes. Thank you. Cool. Hey, this is Bill. Hey, Bill. Hey, good to see you. Um, I'm not sure where I want to go with this, but I found that sometimes when I go to a counselor, more often than not, the first thing they do is like what we saw in the clip, they say, well, what's your problem? Mm -hmm. And uh, my problem when I go to the counselor is that I don't know what my problem is, and I expect the counselor to help me figure it out. <laughs> and it always puts me off because if you say one problem, then they work on it until you say, "Well, that's okay. I feel better. Good. Thank you. Have a good day." Yeah. Uh, how does that differ from how uh, a we can address mm -hmm. the Lord and get counseling that way? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I think. Um, I think that like so so often the problem that we think we have is like so not the problem. You know, we um we think we understand ourselves and that's the case much of the time with therapy. We go into therapy thinking gosh, like um I just need help dealing with my naggy wife, <laughs> you know. And the problem isn't the naggy wife, but it's this feeling of need in yourself. Um and so um, a lot of times we think because we're human beings that we just need the skills. We just need, um, we just need the inner mantra. We just need this tactic in order to be able to tackle the problem that besets us. Um, when more often than not, the problem is deeper than that. And, um, and that can only be, be helped by, um, um, well, in a human, in a human, uh, framework, like in a horizontal framework, it, it can really only be changed by a relationship that's rooted in grace, you know, that's, that's rooted in, um, we'll talk about this later um, in, a, in a different um, session, but 
unconditional positive regard. That was a phrase that um, Carl Rogers, the, a famous therapist used, which is synonymous with grace. Um, that, that we are, we're changed when we're in relationship with someone who loves us as we are and that gives you the space to then explore what's going on. Um, so yeah, beyond that though, the ultimate hope is in Jesus and in the Holy Spirit doing um, what only his scalpel can do. So um, I hope that helps, Bill. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Hey, Ethan, this is Ellis. Um, I was gonna mention a, a Netflix documentary called The Work. Hmm. I don't know if it's for women <clears throat> because it goes into Folsom prison and I don't mean to be a sexist or whatever, but I really liked it and Debbie did. And so I'm just throwing that out. Okay, there. yeah, yeah. And when Bill said, you know, what is the nut? Um, this documentary on Netflix, <clears throat> these uh, guys go into a Folsom prison, you know, where they have the most heinous murders, people that have committed the most heinous crimes, and they do the work and they go back to what they call the seminal wound, mm -hmm. which is, you know, most of us have something from our childhood, young adulthood, teen, teenage years. And it's really remarkable. And the funny thing is the prisoners who've been doing it for a while, and these guys are like, you know, they're murderers. Um, <clears throat> they bring relief to the, the, the outsiders that come in to do it. <laughs> I mean, it's a two-way street. Wow. It's really beautiful. It's only about an hour long and it's on Netflix. Um, mm -hmm. the, uh, the guy who leads it is an um, African-American um, uh, preacher, counselor, it's, I don't know, it's, I've watched it two or three times. So wow. So moved on. Yeah. What, so what name of the film? The name of the film? I'll put it in the chat box. Okay. Um, Great. Um, thanks, Alice. That's really helpful. But it's called The Work. Let me see. Cool. I can't wait to watch that. Um, Bill, this is Courtney Newell. You, if I were you, I would find a different counselor. <laughs> I'm serious. Some there. counselors are out there playing counselor, but you've got to find one that doesn't say what's the problem. You're right. It's his job to listen. Having been through counseling ourselves, um, it's hard to find a really good counselor and uh, mm -hmm. be quiet now. I, think I was probably Bill's counselor. Sorry, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll deny that in public. Yeah. Before my ratio is one in four that I felt was that kind of a good counselor. It was really no. Yeah. This is the pool where cannonball records will be broken. Well, anybody else have any um, any questions or um, comments that um, that this sparked for them? Or um... well, Ethan, I I wanted to thank you for this work. Um, one of the things that crushes me is going to a very pretty church full of very pretty people, mm. knowing that. I'm not one of those people. Mm -hmm. And it is so freeing to not have to uh, feel as though I have to put that on. Mm. So thank you. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Charlie. Yeah. I feel the same way. I feel the same way at church, all these pretty people. And I'm, I'm just, I'm the, I'm the, the, from the, to the discarded toy pile, you know, um, 
but the truth is we're all feeling that, you know, we're all thinking that. And uh, yeah, that, that like Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde image is true for us all. You know, we all have um, a shadow side we'd rather not share with um, the rest of the world, even those at church, even though that's the message that is preached at the church. Um, it is, it is hard to, it's hard to, um, to feel otherwise. Ethan, it's Mike. Dickens. Hey, Mike. Hi. It's just a couple sort of practical questions. We had a psychologist who worked in our practice for 35 years. And so I'm used to working and understand the need for that. Um, but he, he had a separate office and separate record keeping system. And, uh, you know, even though we were sharing patients, we didn't really know what he was talking about with the patients. Hmm. How are you going to handle that? Are you going to have an office at the church and they keep records there? And, you know, yeah. I, what are the boundaries? Sure. Yeah, that's a really important question. And one that Paul and Mary Lou and I have talked about, um, yeah, so I'll have my own record keeping system. Um, this is my new office. It's the it's the vesting room. Um, and so we've got a new coat of paint on in here and you can see the printer box behind me. Um, I can't see anybody. I'm, I'm doing everything via Zoom right now, but um, but eventually this will be my office. And uh, we wanted to have a space that wasn't, you know, right by the parking lot or right by the Magruder house so that we could protect confidentiality as much as possible. Um, even once the uh, pandemic, um, you know, I don't know if that's going to be in 2024 or what, but um, once people are able to see, um, see me in person, uh, even then I'm going to I'm going to make Zoom available to folks um, because I know that for some people, uh, confidentiality and 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 not being seen around the church property is important to them, uh, which I understand totally. Um, so yeah, it'll it'll be the same as your office, where um, you know the clergy won't know who I'm seeing. Uh, I'm also going to be seeing folks from the community, you know that that get referred to me through um, other therapists or doctor friends. And um, so, so yeah, that'll be something that, um, that we protect. I have another question then. If, if you're seeing someone you, you mentioned or it was mentioned in the announcement that you know, you'd be dealing with people with depression and so forth. If you see someone like that, that you thought might need medication if they're seriously mm -hmm. depressed suicidal are you going to have a working relationship with a psychiatrist you can call who can prescribe or how is that going to work yeah that's a good question um as of now i don't have a relationship with a psychiatrist but um but part of the intake process with with folks is um is talking about medication and um if if that's been something in their past and if if it's something that they're curious about um and if so um you know um having a conversation with them about talking to their doctor um but yeah for now that's not something that um that i'm doing for clients so it's definitely a part of the conversation though. Medication is a huge, is a huge question mark for people. Yeah. Hey, Ethan. Hey, Gay. I know that in the past you were involved in the um, jail ministry. Will you be mm -hmm. doing that? Yes. Yeah. I'm still, I'm still doing that. Um, yeah. For those of you that don't know, we have a jail ministry at church, which, um, I run with my wife, Hannah, and, but we've been, we have not been able to go to the jail for gosh. Yeah. Uh, 10 months now. So, um, but yeah, that'll continue on. And um, yeah, in fact, we've already had a couple folks from the jail ministry who have reached out about inmates who are released who might need some mental health care. So 
um, that's a huge, that's a huge need that we're, we're aware of. Yeah, I know that they've had to cut back on volunteers going into the jail because mm -hmm. of yeah. So ministers are pretty much having to take care of the whole bulk of it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and it myself, it's, it's pretty intense. And, mm -hmm. um, but it's such a rewarding program to be able to help these folks. It yeah. can turn them around, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's so true. Yeah. Ethan, this is, this is Nancy Gordon. I just have a quick question. You mentioned in yeah, the beginning hi, that you, hey, you work with the attachment clinic. Is that with Bill Whalen? Yeah. Or so um, I'm so, just curious because uh, I felt him. He's a, or the attachment clinic. Yeah. So, so Bill Whalen uh, founded the attachment clinic with um, my boss, Bob Marvin. And, um, and then they, they, they went off and did ven different ventures. So okay. Bob is still with the attachment clinic and uh, Bill Whalen has uh, started a new thing called Secure Child and they do a lot of the same work. Um, and so I would be happy to, to tell you all about my work at the attachment clinic. It's, it's a lot of, um, to give you the short answer, um, I'm an assigned therapist on a case. Um, a lot of the cases come from the Department of Social Services and um, children who are in foster care or who um, have been adopted and they're having difficulty um, attaching, having an attachment relationship with their parents, their caregivers. And so we work with the parents to, um, to work on that, to basically um, provide for them um, a relationship, uh, an attachment relationship that they can um, hopefully um, bring into their family. And so oftentimes there's a lot of trauma. There's a lot of, um, there's a lot of traumatic history to work through. Um, and there's a lot of guilt and a lot of shame, um, but it is really powerful work. Um, I, I see the family that I see four hours a week. So it's intensive. I work with them a lot. Um, we know each other very well now. Um, but again, it's kind of what, what we were talking about, like a real, real change happens in relationship, happens in a relationship with someone. Um, and um, at least from my perspective, it happens in a relationship of grace. So. Well, the reason I mentioned it is um, I know many of you all know that my husband and I are raising our uh, nine-year-old grandson and um, mm. you know the important thing that I've learned is that it's not um, you know the name mommy or daddy that is key it's as you say it's the attachment that yeah. the child has to the whoever it is whether it's a grandparent a sports coach um, anybody it's that saying of um, it takes a village to raise a child mm -hmm. and um, I just think that's why um, many people will <laughs> They'll say they they don't really um, they like their family of choice, but not their family of origin. You <laughs> yeah. know what I mean? Because yeah. sometimes it's within a family um, dynamic. It's kind of, it's tough, and I think that's why uh, many of the self help the twelve step programs are so popular. Is because you can mm -hmm. develop a relationship with people who um, are willing to listen and not judge. And I just yeah. I think that's key, and that's grace right there. Mm -hmm. that, um, just to be able to be who you are and to um, accept who you are and the mess you've done or whatever not done and not have somebody turn their back on you and just, you know, say, I can't believe you're like that person. It's, it's pretty powerful. And I think um, so true. I, I um, read a book once that, that um, talked about the cross is that's with these, that if you, the 12 step programs are like Jesus, you, you come in and you bear your shame and, mm people accept you as you are. And that is hmm. very freeing. Yeah. Um, so oh. Anyway, I thought I'd put that oh. out there. Yeah. Thanks so much for sharing that. Yeah. Um, yeah. At the attachment clinic, we talk about, we, we are wired, we are wired for um, relationship. We're wired to be, to, to seek um, a safe haven in another person. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I would say also that we are wired to seek a safe haven in God. Right. And um, so often our families of origin, they, they wind up being 
a safe haven of some sort, but um, with some missing pieces. And oftentimes we can, we have chosen families that can provide that in a way that's different uh, and sometimes better. <laughs> so, wow. yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Can you finish, Bill, again? Can you just quickly recap for us how we access your services? What's it all about? Does it cost more than five dollars? Things like that. Yeah, yeah. It's um, it's it's definitely um, it's a little bit more than five dollars. Um, you know that video was made a while ago, so it's it's going to be ten dollars, but it'll only be five minutes. Um, <laughs> so the um. We'll send a link out that will take you to the page, but the, the long and short of it is um, you can email me at Ethan at ChristChurchSeville.org. Um, my phone number is also on the website if you want to call. Um, and first thing that will happen is we'll talk for 20 minutes and just get a sense of um, if this is a good fit. And then if you feel it's a good fit, um, I'll send you like the intake forms and, um, and we'll get a first session on the books. Um, we have a sliding scale, but the, the rate is $90, $90 an hour. Um, I, so, and then I, um, we can talk more about specifics beyond that, but that's the long and short of it. And, and Paul Walker, um, this is Donna. Um, would I be correct in assuming that if somebody needed counseling services but didn't have the, the funding for it, uh, insurance or cash or whatever, the parishioners fund might be able to help? I would certainly love for that to happen, although the man standing right behind you would be the person to, uh, to give the thumbs up for that. So, uh, yes, we have a parishioners fund, and that uh, feels to me the absolute um, bullseye for how that could be used. Thank you so much, Donna. Okay. We also have a, uh, in addition to that, we're going to have a, we don't know what we're going to call it yet, like a kind of Samaritan fund. Uh, that's part of the fundraising for the counseling center when it really gets up and running. But right now too, to have, um, have a pot of money that can be used, accessed by the clergy so that uh, it can supplement um, with the sliding scale. Um, one of the major, major issues that we have or desires that we have for the counseling center, beginning right now with Christchurch Counseling, we're hoping to open a larger center at, with having some off-site offices, Mike, uh, not just Ethan's, uh, but have some off-site offices because just what you said was super important. But um, to have um, affordability is a major thing because people will spend money on all kinds of things, but they somehow don't prioritize the need for mental health, which actually could be the key to everything else in their life. So that's one of the, that's one of the main initiatives. Thank you uh, for that little um, public uh, service announcement there. We can probably close up now, I think Ethan, after 11. Yeah, yeah. Um, so see everybody next week? Yeah. All right. That's Ethan, awesome job. Great to see everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.